Uh, I have the honor today of introducing uh, Judge Jim Ho of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Before he was a judge, Judge Ho was a partner at Gibson Dunn. He has a long and established track record in the field of religious liberty, including a rare summary reversal from the Supreme Court. And he has excellent judgment as a judge, uh, with the exception of his clerk hiring, of which I am a lucky recipient of his bad judgment. But anyway, I wanted to just do a quick introduction and turn it over for the panel for the rest of the discussion. Thank you all for being here. Good morning. Uh, you know, normally uh, you don't really want to be the last panel uh, right before lunch, but I was just talking to Professor Werman, and if I understand his theory correctly, uh, if he's right, uh, and there's no religious liberty provisions against the states, we don't actually have to have this panel. So <laughs> we can just go straight to lunch now if you guys want to do that. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Eric, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, for inviting me here. Uh, contrary to what Eric might tell you in the hallways, uh, I do not have favorite law clerks. Um, <laughs> but I will say, uh, with that principle in mind, uh, that I think it's absolutely wonderful what you and your colleagues have done with this conference today. And what I will say is that whenever I uh, am at a, an event or a, a cocktail party and I bump into somebody who tells me, oh, I just met one of your former law clerks, there's a high likelihood that they're talking about Eric. And, <laughs> and I, I want to say... <laughs> I, I just want to say it's, it's wonderful all, all, all that you do uh, to, to, to bring people together. Um, but I am truly uh, delighted to be included in this inaugural uh, conference uh, of the Midwestern uh, chapters of the Federal Society. Uh, it was uh, just over 25 years ago uh, that I started law school uh, here in the Midwest at the University of Chicago, and uh, thus over, just over 25 years ago that I uh, first became a member of the Federal Society. Uh, I'm especially honored uh, to moderate this panel on religious liberty. It's certainly a timely topic uh, for, for a number of reasons. One, the COVID-19 pandemic has not only presented severe challenges to virtually every aspect of human endeavors, it has specifically resulted in a number of legal challenges involving religious liberty. Uh, in, in preparing for today, I uh, sort of... Uh, took a, uh, my own review of recent Supreme Court work. And by my count, uh, the United States Supreme Court has issued opinions in nine different cases involving the intersection of religious liberty uh, and COVID, uh, COVID policies. Uh, if my count is correct, uh, and if it's not, I'll blame my law clerks, uh, not Eric. Uh, uh, but if, if my count is correct, the win-loss record for religious liberty is two and six. And that's two wins for religious liberty claimant, six losses, and one decision that I would, uh, I think, fairly characterize as a mixed uh, win, win and loss. What should we make uh, of this 2-6 win-loss record uh, in the Supreme Court? And then looking beyond the COVID, where do things stand at the intersection of religious liberty and the LGBT community? Uh, the Supreme Court has decided two cases on that front uh, that some would describe as blockbuster cases, Masterpiece, Masterpiece Cake Shop and Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. But on the other hand, other observers would say that the Supreme Court actually resolved very little uh, in these, uh, those two cases. If you're interested in sort of getting the true nature and extent of and, and scope of religious liberty in that admittedly uh, highly sensitive space. Uh, so what to make of all of this? Uh, fortunately, we have uh, a, a stellar panel uh, to help us distill all this. Uh, first is Thomas Berg, uh, who is the James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy at the University of St. Thomas uh, in uh, St. Thomas School of Law in Minnesota, uh, where he teaches religious liberty, constitutional law, intellectual property, and also helps lead the Religious Liberty uh, Appellate Clinic. Uh, he's the author or co-author of five books and contributes regularly to SCOTUS blog, Christianity Today, Christianity Today and many other venues. Uh, he practiced law in Chicago, and I'm very happy to report, uh, was a law clerk uh, for, uh, on the Fifth Circuit uh, for Judge Alvin Rubin. Uh, Justin Butterfield is Deputy General Counsel at the First Liberty Institute. Uh, he previously served as Senior Advisor for Conscience and Religious Freedom 
at the Department of Health and Human Services, where he launched a new division of the HHS Office for Civil Rights uh, that was dedicated to protecting rights of conscience and religious freedom in healthcare. He has litigated numerous religious freedom cases and written several, several scholarly articles on religion and the law. Uh, John Sauer has served as the Solicitor General of Missouri since 2017. Uh, he has also served as a federal prosecutor and in private practice. Uh, he has first chaired many jury and bench trials and presented oral argument in the US Supreme Court, the Eighth Circuit, the Supreme Court of Missouri, and several other appellate courts. Uh, I personally had the good fortune of getting to know him uh, when he was a law clerk for Justice Scalia, uh, but, and he also clerked uh, previously for Judge Ludig of the Fourth Circuit. Unfortunately, our fourth, our fourth panelist, uh, Professor Andy Koppelman, had to withdraw for personal reasons. Uh, but I think we'll, uh, so I think there's, a, I guess, a theme to today. We're always going to drop out a panelist, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I think we're in good stead with our three panelists. So, Professor, would you like to get us started? Hey, thank you, Your Honor. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, so I'm actually going to um, try to connect religious liberty to Lincoln. So I don't think everybody has to say something about Lincoln in this uh, event, I'm sure, but, uh, but I'm going to, uh, to try to make a connection. Uh, Lincoln's second inaugural address is the greatest and most astounding speech ever given by an American president. In it, he audaciously proposed that after four years of war and 700,000 deaths, the nation should go forward, quote, with malice toward none, with malice toward none, with charity for all. But Lincoln's words also speak to today's conditions of bitter pol uh, political and cultural polarization. Unfortunately, controversies over religious liberty contribute to the polarization. So I have two points to make today. First, one of the many good reasons for strongly protecting religious liberty is that doing so can help contain polarization, keeping it from becoming even more destructive than it is now. But second, religious liberty protection to be credible must protect all faiths and it must leave for other, room for other rights as well. We need charity for all, in Lincoln's words. So first, why is religious liberty important to containing polarization? Because the social science work tells us that polarization is driven by each side's fear of the other. And religious liberty uh, of the other side. And religious liberty is an important means of reducing fear, namely the widespread fear that my opponents will punish me for living according to my deepest commitments. We instituted religious liberty in America in the founding period and have uh, continued with it since in order to head off conflicts like those in Reformation Europe, where Protestants and Catholics killed each other because each side feared the other would kill them first. Now, for several years, religious uh, conservatives have feared that progressives will impose destructive penalties on them, and with some reason. So just take one of many incidents. Recall when, in 2015, President Obama's Solicitor General Don Verrilli told the Supreme Court in the Obergefell versus Hodges oral argument that stripping tax exemptions from organizations that oppose same-sex marriage, quote, was going to be an issue someday. That statement got a lot of play in the 2016 election. So what legal doctrines are necessary to protect religious freedom strongly? It's crucial that the Free Exercise Clause be against more than just targeting of religion. Uh, when a law prohibits a meaningful religious practice, it matters, uh, matters little from a free exercise standpoint whether that law is aimed at religion, as some decisions might be read to say that that's all the free exercise clause is about, or whether it regulates non-religious con conduct as well. Either way, believers suffer, they're prevented from exercising their religion, and they will likely feel fear and resentment. Now, Currently, the court protects against much more than targeting of religion. It follows the rule from Employment Division versus Smith that a neutral law of genital applicability can be applied to burden religion, religious conduct. But the court reads that rule to say 
that a law flunks general applicability if it protects any secular activity that poses similar threats to the government's interest that the religious activity poses. And that approach sometimes uh, analog analogized to uh, most favored nation status in trade theory, uh, in trade law, uh, has been highly protected, right? Because the, the laws very often make exceptions for other interests, and if religion must be protected in those circumstances too, then that's highly protective. This is what led the court to strike down COVID-based bans on in-person worship after the early months of the pandemic, after a few decisions, as, as Judge Ho mentioned, that had deferred. Uh, now, indeed, the court has done a lot under Smith's neutrality rule. It protected Jack Phillips of Masterpiece Cake Shop because the state had gr uh, discriminated against him, penalizing him uh, for refusing to design, custom design a, 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 a same uh, cake celebrating a same-sex wedding, while allowing other bakers to refuse to design cakes <coughs> with anti-gay messages. It protected Catholic foster care agencies in Philadelphia last year in the Fulton case because the city had authorized other discretionary exceptions to its non-discrimination policy. Now, the other way to protect free exercise strongly, the other protective doctrinal, doctrinal approach would be to overrule Smith's unprotective aspects. That is, the, the idea that only a non-neutral law is subject to strict, strict scrutiny. Overrule that and apply cl close scrutiny to all laws that substantially burden relig religion, even if they are generally applicable across the board. Given how protective the court has been under Smith, overruling it might not make a huge difference at this point in the results. But it would be an improvement. We can talk about this more in the uh, question, uh, questions, if people have questions about it. But the threshold requirement of showing that there is some other secular activity that has been exempted or protected, and that that is comparable to the religious conduct, that greatly complicates litigation. And it has some other problems. Uh, uh, and the COVID cases show how complicated it can make the litigation. But under either approach, we should give significant exemptions from non-discrimination non laws to religious schools and social services that need to adhere to their religious tenets about marriage and sex in the services they provide and in the people they hire to carry out their mission. Uh, exemptions in the for-profit sphere have to be significantly narrower, given the interest in ensuring that all persons have ready access to commercial goods and services and jobs. Uh, but we should, and the court likely will, uh, continue to protect the small videographer or artist who can't in conscience provide personal services to celebrate a same-sex wedding, uh, or the marriage counselor who can't counsel same-sex couples when other providers are available, as they usually are. But LGBTQ religious conflicts, conflicts between LGBTQ claims and religious claims, are also a context, context I think, that calls for charity for all, for protection for both sides. But the claims of same-sex couples and religious traditionalists actually have important parallels. Both groups want to be able to live, live lives of integrity consistent with what they understand as fundamental features of their identity. And both want to be able to do so not just in insular settings, but in public civil society. That is in civil marriage for the same-sex couple and in charitable or business activity for the religious objector. It's ironic when each side entirely dismisses the other's claims, for the claims share important features. And recognizing something in LGBTQ rights claims would give greater credibility to religious liberty claims. That's my second point. Unless arguments for religious liberty give recognition to other interests, religious liberty can't maintain credibility or calm polarization. More broadly, in today's polarized debates, it would help if more of us recognized something in human, I'm sorry, familiar and human in our opponents. Such commonality means that if I denigrate your interests, I may also well be threatening 
my own. We see this in instances where conservative Christians have uh, denigrated the religious freedom claims of Muslims, often stating principles like Islam is really a political uh, movement rather than a religion, that then are turned around against conservative Christians as well, and they're accused of being just politically <laughs> motivated. Seeing commonalities might well also give us greater sympathy for the other side's interest in preserving their freedom, and in turn, greater inclination to find solutions that preserve freedom for both sides. Obviously, it won't eliminate the conflicts, but it would make them easier to resolve. If conservatives recognize something familiar, familiar in LGBTQ claims, they can support at least some non-discrimination laws. If progressives sympathized not with religious traditionalist views, but with the predicament the traditionalists face in being penalized for living by those views, they'd be more willing to allow meaningful exemptions. So this outlook supports enacting non-discrimination laws and marriage rights together with strong religious exemptions. I recognize that how far the non-discrimination rules should extend is a complicated question. Just think, for example, of transgender claims that involve questions about when is a medical intervention on an adolescent permitted or effects on women's domestic violence shelters or women's competitive sports. I'm not saying that those, uh, those, are, those are all significant complications to be, uh, to be uh, analyzed, but those complications don't undermine the argument for basic rules preventing discrimination against transgender employees or customers. The religious conservatives shouldn't try to undo Bostock or Obergefell and shouldn't oppose LGBTQ non-discrimination laws in total. Details, of course, to be uh, debated. Lincoln's second inaugural address combined firm moral purpose with humility. He deftly criticized those who, quote, dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But he also proposed that the offense of slavery was caused by both North and South, and that the war was punishment for both. God was just, and slavery monstrously unjust, but God's justice could not be equated fully with either side's views. The Almighty has his own purposes, Lincoln said. That combination of moral firmness and humility is what empowered Lincoln, while still prosecuting the war, to call for charity for all. We need that combination today on religious liberty and other polarized disputes. I can determine that the other side, whether that's progressives or conservatives, is deeply mistaken and still simultaneously be alert to flaws and arrogance on my side. And our polarization may spin entirely out of control if we don't develop greater ability to pursue moral purposes, but also cultivate sympathy and humility. Well, I've been doing religious liberty law for 12 years now. Um, 10 at First Liberty and two is a little detour to the Department of Health and Human Services, as Judge Ho mentioned. And in those 12 years, I've seen the number and the nature of the attacks on religious liberty increase significantly. And um, as Professor Berg mentioned, I, I think that our increasing polarization in society is one of the factors of that. Um, I think, though, that the driving force behind that polarization is particularly in the religious liberty context is underlying shifts in the nature of how we view religion in this country. So when, when I started practicing religious liberty law, um, probably 12% of the country um, considered themselves to be of no religious affiliation. Today, that's 26%, or really I should say as of 2019, which was the last study I found that was 26%, it may be higher today. And that's a large shift in the number of people who consider themselves to have no religious affiliation. Um, and what that does is, Prior to, uh, in the early days of my practice in religious liberty law, people understood the religious mentality even if they didn't share it themselves. So you have somebody who um, wants to share their faith or wants to live according to their religious convictions. And they may go before a judge who disagrees with them, but that judge doesn't view them as 
as wrong or evil for wanting to hold to their religious convictions because that judge, even if the judge doesn't hold a religious conviction personally, or a government official that's involved doesn't hold a religious conviction personally, that judge or that government official knows people who do, understands people who do, but as the number of nuns in this country has increased, the bubbles that people are living in is also increasing. And more and more we see situations where churches, religious schools, um, litigate issues and on the basis of what they believe are well understood religious principles like forgiveness and the people that they're litigating in front of just don't understand the concept. Um, when I started, the majority of the religious liberty issues that we dealt with tended to be issues of confusion. Local government officials who had discriminatory zoning regulations because they wanted you know, their little power, their little kingdom, um, or schools that misunderstood the law and they told valedictorians they were allowed to say anything they wanted in their valedictorian address so long as it wasn't religious. Um, that has changed. And eight, 10 years ago, um, we started to see the focus in religious liberty litigation shift from those sorts of confusion, brush fire issues, to really issues where they are major political issues and there's this polarizing um, effect that is driving the, the parties away. So you go from, for instance, Justice Kennedy's uh, statement in Obergefell where he says it must be emphasized that religions and those who adhere to religious doctrines may continue to advocate with utmost sincere conviction that by design precepts, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. The First Amendment ensures that religious organizations and persons are given proper protection as they seek to teach the principles that are so fulfilling and so central to their lives and faiths and to their own deep aspirations to continue the family structure they have long revered. So his, his approach was you know, people of faith, we are going to respect your views. You can continue to, to advocate for that. You can continue to hold on to those beliefs that you've held for thousands of years. Two, uh, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights statement that religious accommodations, quote, represent an orchestrated nationwide effort by extremists to promote bigotry cloaked in the mantle of religious freedom, unquote. And uh, the commissioner's chair, Martin Castro, said, the phrases religious liberty and religious freedom will stand for nothing except hypocrisy, as so long as they remain code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, Christian supremacy, or any form of intolerance. So the view has shifted to where religious, religious principles, people who are holding to their religious convictions, are not just people that are disagreed with, have a different view from the, the judge or the government official, rather they're evil and their opinions are to be stopped at all costs. Um, we, we saw that with, uh, Really, the first situation like that that I got involved with was the contraceptive mandate, which I'm sure many of you remember the Hobby Lobby and the Little Sisters of the Poor litigation, um, where the federal government said, you know, we, we are going to require religious organizations to provide uh, health care coverage for, uh, or not just religious organizations, religious organizations and, and uh, secular organizations and uh, for profit organizations provide health care coverage for contraceptions contraceptives. So certain organizations, like the Little Sisters of the Poor, uh, an organization of Catholic nuns, felt, according to their religious convictions, they couldn't provide any contraceptives. Uh, the owners of Hobby Lobby had a subset of contraceptives that they couldn't, um, couldn't accept providing a coverage for because they believed that those four uh, particular contraceptives were actually abortifacients, according to their religious convictions. And the government was relentless in going after these groups. You know, nuns, priests, the religious organizations across this country, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of lawsuits. Um, I sued the government twice, um, once, once for a, uh, a pastoral ministry that, that put out books, published books for pastors um, on these issues. And they were being told by the federal government, you have to provide contraceptive coverage that you believe is morally repugnant. And there was no willingness to compromise. That was different than the sorts of religious liberty fights we'd seen before. Um, that was really one of the things that got me to, to into HHS and starting the Conscience and Religious Freedom Division was we did not want the Department of Health and Human Services to continue going down this path of systematically targeting people of faith. Um, while I was there, I learned that, that uh, 
There were even worse abuses at some of the state levels. For instance, California requiring religious organizations not just to provide contraceptions, contraceptives, but to provide insurance coverage for elective abortions. And uh, when, when we tried to take action against them, California insisted that they were perfectly permissible in doing so because they were not discriminating against any religious organization. They were only telling Blue Cross Blue Shield and the health insurance providers that they had to provide the, this coverage and they couldn't offer their plans to, to religious organizations, even though Blue Cross Blue Shield was perfectly willing to provide a health insurance plan to religious organizations that would have met their religious convictions. Um, so that's the sort of, of polar, increasing polarization that's really driving a lot of the issues in religious liberty. And while I, I certainly agree that it's, it's a problem, um, the problem with, you know, can't we all just get along is that we've tried that. And unfortunately, if you look at, for instance, um, the DC Human Rights Act, it was, the, requires organizations in, in DC to not discriminate against people on certain bases, including sexual orientation. Well, the Armstrong Amendments were passed in 1988 that said uh, religious organizations are exempt. You, you can't force a religious organization um, to, to you know, accept people to, the, to their membership that, that would violate their religious convictions. And that was kind of the, the compromise situation that led to the DC Human Rights Act being able to get through. And then what they do, they came back and they said, okay, that's great, we've got both, now we're gonna repeal all the religious exceptions, and they did that in 2014. Or they'll just strong arm people of faith. Uh, you know, Title IX has a, a uh, sex discrimination provision, and many religious, or religious schools seek an, uh, an accommodation for the sex discrimination provision because they don't want to require, for instance, um, people of mixed sexes in the same dorm um, or things like that. And the Department of Education requires, has been requiring them to submit a request for this accommodation. And what the Department of Education started doing then is listing, you know, here's the blacklist of all the religious schools that have told us they, they want a religious accommodation here's our website where you can see everybody and take action against them. Um, when we've seen it, another area that I encountered at, at HHS was in federal funding. Um, there used to be a regulation, 45 CFR 75.300C, that said that if you wanted to receive federal funding, you had to agree you could not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And for many faith-based organizations, that was impossible. And it became even more of a problem because a lot of state licensing agencies tie their licensure to the federal funding regulation. So it wasn't just about federal money, it was about if you are a faith-based organization and you believe that you know, you're, you're a woman's shelter and you don't want the, you don't believe according to your religious beliefs that a transgendered person should be in with the women in the, in the, in the um, uh, women's shelter, then because of this provision, they would not receive state licensure. So it had, it had deep impacts on their ability not just to receive funding, but their ability to exist. Um, and of course, we saw then um, uh, the continued sort of, of not just disagreement with people of faith, but as the Supreme Court called it in Masterpiece Cake Shop, animus towards uh, Jack Phillips. And in uh, our case, Sweet Cakes by Melissa, the same sort of thing. Um, uh, bakers who who uh, were perfectly willing to provide services to, to same-sex couples, but they would not bake a same-sex wedding cake because they felt that that was um, uh, putting their endorsement on the on the wedding, so to speak, and in accordance with their religious convictions, they couldn't do it. Uh, well, in in both Jack Phillips and in Sweet Cakes by Melissa, the the uh, commissions in the case of Sweet Cakes by by Melissa, the, the um, Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries, were very clear that they considered their religious beliefs not just wrong, but raw evil, and um, were extremely strong in their, in their hostility towards them. And in the case of, of the Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries, fined them $135,000. Uh, we appealed that. The Oregon Court of Appeals said, yes, Boley acted with animus, vacated the $135,000 fine, and then sent it back to Boley, which is not <laughs> much help. Um, Boley, by the way, then said, well, fine, we're not gonna give you back your $135,000, that's ours. 
Um, so we're litigating with them over that as well. Uh, of course, 303 Creative is coming up on this same issue about a web designer, and uh, hopefully that will give the Supreme Court uh, opportunity to provide some clarity, uh, but we'll have to see. Uh, the newest area where this, this has, has uh, become an issue is on COVID. Interestingly enough, when, when the COVID issue started, I didn't really think COVID would be a polarized, hot issue. I thought that was an area where people would agree that we could have differences of opinion and would be somewhat tolerant of different views. Um, and then, you know, Governor Bashir said, we're going to have police in Kentucky go to every church on Easter morning and record the license plate of every car that goes to church. And... Um, on Fire Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, wanted to have a drive-in church service because you know COVID doesn't doesn't pass through cars, um, and their mayor told them that that was illegal, and we had to sue so that they could have a drive-in church service staying in their own cars. Um, Justice Judge Justin Walker said, you know, on a Holy Thursday, an American mayor criminalized the communal celebration of Easter. That sentence is one that this court never expected to see outside the pages of a dystopian novel or perhaps the pages of The Onion. <laughs> but two days ago, citing the need for social distancing during the current pandemic, Louisville's mayor, Greg Fisher, ordered Christians not to attend Sunday services, even if they remained in their cars to worship. And even though it's Easter, the mayor's decision is stunning and it is beyond all reason unconstitutional. Um, we represented Capitol Hill Baptist Church who wanted to have an outdoor worship service, socially distanced, that was not permitted, although outdoor protests at the same time were permitted. Unfortunately, courts have been you know, inconsistent. Um, as Judge Ho noted, there's been a numerous Supreme Court opinions on this issue. Um, from Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo, where I think the Supreme Court got it right and said that you, you have to treat religious gatherings the same as you treat secular gatherings. Um, to, to Calvary Chapel versus Sisalak, where the Supreme Court for some reason refused to strike down a law saying that churches were limited to 50 attendees, regardless of size, uh, but casinos could have 50% occupancy. So you could have a converted football, a, a converted basketball arena, and you're capped at 50 people. You could have a small casino with a with a a 200 member occupancy and you could have 100 people in there. Um, that makes no sense to me, but it's, it's uh, what happens when I think people start looking more at politics and, and balancing cultural, cultural uh, spin out than, than what, what's reasonable. The other interesting thing that I've seen from COVID is, and a kind of a new frontier in religious liberty issues, is challenging sincerity. So. One of the things I've seen from people who are skeptical of people with religious convictions on, on COVID is they, they assume that they must be lying about their religious beliefs. And having talked with many people of faith who don't want to receive the vaccine often um, because of, of um, the present branch of COVID vaccines having been developed or tested using aborted fetal cells and the, the objectors' uh, pro-life convictions, um, not believing that's something they can take in accordance with their religious beliefs, they're being challenged. Like, well, well, do you take aspirin? That was tested on aborted fetal cells, uh, which is true, although it was tested on aborted fetal cells decades after it was released as a product, not during its development, which seems to many people to be a significant difference. Um, but, but just over and over again, we're seeing government officials challenging people of faith because of insisting that they're lying about their beliefs. And that's, that's a new area, and that's just wrong in many cases. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Judge Ho, for the kind of uh, My comments are probably gonna echo some of the themes that were brought up in the first two speakers, so I'll try to keep them as brief as possible. I always start with the caveat that I'm here not speaking on behalf of my employer, the Missouri Attorney General's Office of the State of Missouri. And uh, although there hasn't been too much daylight in the positions I took as in private practice on behalf of religious liberty that I've taken under the last two Missouri attorneys general, uh, in addition to that, this is kind of a practitioner's perspective on things. Uh, and it focuses on legal doctrine. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, I don't have the same 
a very interesting trench perspective that Justin just uh, portrayed, both from his government service and from litigation, but here goes. Uh, I think the big story in the last seven, eight, maybe 10 years at, uh, uh, at the US Supreme Court on the issue of religious liberty is the failure for the advocates of religious liberty to deliver big wins clarifying critical issues on the most controversial points. There have been some very significant wins on, uh, on, on important issues, and I won't overstate this, but on really big issues, that you, you've developed a series of very narrow opinions that do deliver to that, that you know, it, a person, that religious organization or individual, a victory, but a victory that's on a very narrow grounds that leave a lot of room left in the future for future litigation and no real assurance that the threat to religious liberty that's being perceived as being put to bed or put to rest, or as Justice Kali would say, you know, about the ghoul stabbed in the heart with a pencil. Uh, uh, so in any event, uh, I think of four decisions, obviously, right off the bat. Zubik is a big one on the HHS mandate as it applied to religious organizations, nonprofits. Zubik, they just sent it back and said, oh, go settle this case. And I think Justin, Justin's comment indicate that settling that case was going to be difficult. And, it, and indeed, it never happened. It came back uh, again in a different instantiation last year in Little Sisters of the Poor uh, uh, case. Masterpiece Cake Shop, another great example of this. A 7-2 to decision. Who would have thought that Masterpiece Cake Shop would win a 7-2 to decision in the Supreme Court? But they did. But they did it on extremely narrow grounds. Fulton against City of Philadelphia is another great example of this. Again, in many ways, if you read, I, I love one of my favorite opinions is Justice Alito's separate opinion in Fulton against City of Philadelphia, where he says, wow, you know, we granted cert to decide whether or not we should overrule Smith. And then somehow we didn't get around to doing that. And I'm kind of puzzled why. You can tell he's kind of like puzzled why the separate opinion with Barrett and Kavanaugh, who says, well, we really believe Smith was wrongly decided. So there's five votes for that. But what do we replace it with? And Justice Alito, in his sort of peppery manner, is like, why don't we replace it with Sherbert, which is what it, <laughs> what it did replace. So interesting thing. He also is a great phrase in that separate opinion in the Fulton case, uh, where Justice Alito says, look, the majority opinion has delivered Catholic social services of Philadelphia with a legal victory, but uh, uh, it might as well be written on the dissolving paper that's sold in magic shops, because it's based on like the interpretation of a, a, a municipal uh, uh, a non-discrimination ordinance and a contract, a form contract that were given out to all the social service providers who wanted to place foster children with, with foster parents. Uh, and he says, all you got to do is tweak this and we'll be right back into this. And if you've read the lower court opinions in those cases, district court and in the Third Circuit, you know that as uh, for the reasons Justin was alluding to, you know, no one's going to relent on the other side in that case. So uh, I think that's really the big story. And that was, uh, I think, became more of a big story with both Fulton against City of Philadelphia and to a lesser extent with the Little Sisters of the Poor decision. Again, there's a separate Alito opinion in the, Little Sisters, the recent Little Sisters of the Poor decision where he said, I'd go the next step and put an end to this, you know, 10-year legal odyssey that the Little Sisters of the Poor have been on because this is going to keep going on. They will be litigating and litigating and litigating until, you know, with no end in sight about whether or not they have a conscience right uh, under RIFRA in that particular case, under conscious right, under RIFRA to not comply with this HHS mandate. It's been around forever. I mean, in that case, uh, something that was astonishing to me who had been involved in HHS mandate litigation back when I was in private practice and hadn't really dealt with it much in several years, that the lower court said that it was arbitrary and capricious. You lacked legal authority to grant religious conscience protections, right? You lacked statutory authority is what they held. HHS lacked statutory authority to grant religious accommodation to religious objectors when it came to the HHS mandate. I thought that holding was uh, surprising and, and kind of troubling for all the reasons that Justin alluded to. So I think the big story is there hasn't been a, a, a there haven't been these sort of big knockout victors that would put this to bed. Even though you would think that the advocates for religious liberty might have the votes for that kind of uh, thing, and certainly under the court's current composition, some might expect that. However, uh, so far that really hasn't happened. And I think that one of the most interesting uh, developments on this point recently, Justin alluded to the 303 Creative case, which is a wedding videographer, uh, uh, and. If you've been following this, you know for like the last 30 years, every religious claimant, religious, almost everyone, raising a religious liberty claim has also asserted a free speech claim, right? Free exercise and free speech. The idea there is that gets you into the hybrid rights exception under Smith. So it's almost like malpractice. If there's anything expressive at all about what your client is doing, it's almost malpractice not to say, hey, it's, we're raising a free speech claim too, therefore hybrid rights, therefore strict scrutiny under Smith. So it's really interesting to me about the 303 creative case. Keep in mind that they just had a huge fight you know, a couple years ago in the Fulton case about whether they should overrule Smith. Well, the cert petition in 303 Creative said, 
please overrule Smith, that's QP2. And QP1 is whether or not we have a free speech and or free exercise right to engage in this particular, there's a compelled speech component to this case as well, but under the free speech clause and the free exercise clause, is our client free to engage in their religious expression with what they want to do with wedding videographers without directly participating in, say, in, say, in celebrating, in their view, same-sex weddings. So the Supreme Court granted that case, but they rewrote, they didn't grant QP2, which is overrule Smith. They only granted the first question presented, and they rewrote it. They wrote out the free exercise claim and said, we are only granting this under a free speech claim. So it is a free speech claim. It's a powerful free speech claim. I think they're going to win. And you know, no one knows, but I think they're going to win. Uh, uh, but what's really interesting is the Supreme Court, in that particular grant, which happened you know, recently, I don't remember, within the last couple months, I think, they've, they, they've almost sent a message that we're not going back to, will you please overrule Smith? So uh, uh, that's kind of the, uh, that was, uh, that was, maybe they'll come back to it a year or two or two years. Uh, I mean, you have five votes in Fulton to say Smith was wrongly decided and at least probably should be overruled. But uh, you have this separate opinion saying, well, we're not sure what we replace it with and we don't need to decide that today. Uh, but apparently they are not going to decide it in 303 Creative Ever. And, you know, they'll, I think they'll continue to be peppered with certain positions that say, please overrule Smith, please overrule Smith. But I don't know if that's going to happen any time in the near future uh, uh, based on looking at the tea leaves. I could be wrong. I, I, it's hard to predict, but that's uh, uh, where I think about it. So the question is, what is the status of, uh, uh, of religious liberty claimants, what are they doing? How are they going to do now, right? Now you have this series of narrow, uh, uh, narrow victories, so to speak, at the US Supreme Court. I, I would make two points. One question is, does it make a big difference, right? I think Professor Berg asked the question of, uh, 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 it, does it, it might not make a difference whether or not they overrule Smith. And there are very powerful legal tools, doctrinal tools, in the current case law. Uh, 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 in the current case law, if you're advocating on behalf of a client who's raising a religious liberty claim. And I'd emphasize, I, I'd say, depending on how you count them, two or three of them. The first one, of course, is almost all religious activity is expressive in some sense. Uh, uh, it's hard to imagine. I was driving the, in the car on the way here. I was trying to imagine what's a religious liberty claim that could only be cast as a religious liberty claim and not as a free speech claim, not as a free ex expression claim. I'm sure there are some. I couldn't think of any. At least not off the top of my head. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, you're talking about, you know, how long your hair is in prison. Is that expressive? You probably could, if you're a good lawyer, cast that as a, a free speech claim uh, as well as a free exercise claim. And of course, if you do, you automatically get to all the strict scrutiny that free, that the religious claimants wants if Smith is overruled, right? That's so that's one bucket you can go into. And another is suppose you are in free exercise land, you still have some really really powerful legal arguments to make uh, uh, that are really going to be essentially make Smith look in practical effect, if these doctrines are followed, look a lot like a strict scrutiny land. One of those was intended against Newsom, which is one of the very latest of the COVID shutdown cases. And that was a home Bible study in California. California said, hey, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, if you're going to have a gathering at your home, it's only got to be three households. It's going to be so many people, that kind of, those kinds of restrictions. And the Supreme Court uh, uh, stayed that, uh, essentially said you can't enforce that against a home Bible study because you're you're treating comparable secular activity like going to the hardware store differently than you're treating a home Bible study. Now, there's a really powerful dissent from Justice Kagan in that case where she says, this only applies to home gatherings, and home gatherings are not similar, not relevantly similar when it comes to COVID transmission to going to the, COVID, to, to the grocery store, the hardware store. Because you know, when you're at a home gathering, you all sit together in the same room for a long time. You don't just go in and get your groceries and check out. You're not typically not very well socially distanced, and there's enforcement issues and so forth. But the majority held, uh, 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 no, uh, if there is, so long as you're religious, <clears throat> as long as the state is treating any comparable uh, uh, secular activity, disfavorably compared to the religious activity, it's not neutral and generally applicable, right? And therefore, uh, 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 and therefore you, get, you get to the strict scrutiny, right? And that's a really, really powerful doctrine. Now, it's, as I'll emphasize in a minute, it's not a very clear doctrine. It's not very clear in its application. Uh, and Justice Alito covers this, I think, very, very well in his Fulton opinion, where he goes through and he says, look, Smith is not workable because we have all, the own justices on this court in the last five or six COVID lockdown cases have all over the map about what constitutes a relevant comparator. Now, for a good lawyer, that's an opportunity. It's like, oh, I can find good comparators, and I can, I can get out of strict scrutiny that way. Uh, but in terms of clarity of legal doctrine and equality of application nationwide, it's not an ideal situation. Uh, then the second, uh, uh, the second issue here is actually in Fulton itself in the majority opinion by Chief Justice Roberts. In that opinion, he says, he says, 
even if you get to strict scrutiny, they did get, they said that this doesn't survive under strict scrutiny. If you get to strict scrutiny, the governmental interest that has to be compelling is not the general interest in the anti-discrimination norm, which almost all judges will probably concede is a compelling state interest. It has to be on the specific application to the religious claimant. So the, the state can't defend this by defend a restriction. There it's, you know, the city of Philadelphia is saying, hey, Catholic social services, you know, you have to allow a place with same-sex couples or we're going to, you know, booch out of here, which is what they did, right? Even though literally not a single same-sex couple had ever applied to place, place uh, uh, to, to, to be a sort of approved foster parent couple with Catholic social services. And there were, depending on, uh, actually interesting, the opinions disagree about the majority opinion says 20 and the Alito opinion says 27, but there are at least 20 other agencies in the city of Philadelphia that do place uh, foster children with same-sex couples. There are many, many avenues for this. So no one's ever applied to be a same-sex couple approved foster parent with Catholic Social Services in Philadelphia, and yet they shut it down. So, and what, what the, the, the Roberts opinion says is, in order for the state's interest to be compelling, you don't have to have a compelling interest in the anti-discrimination norm at a general level. It has to be specific. Right? You have to have a compelling state interest in making sure this particular religious claimant cannot comply with their particular religious claims in this. That's also an immensely powerful doctrine if you're advocating on behalf of religious liberty claimants. That's something that you could argue with uh, uh, you know, very, very, very powerfully because uh, for a lot of the reasons that Justin said, uh, in most of these cases, it isn't a situation where, gee, if all the religious, you know, whatever it is, you know, the religious videographers, the religious florists, or the religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, foster parent placement agencies, if all of them were unavailable, in almost every one of these cases, there are many, many other avenues for, you know, the people who are, who are claiming discrimination to participate in whatever the relevant activity is. Uh, 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 so those are two really powerful doctrines. So they're really, the law has developed in a way where the court has not overruled Smith, but it has given religious liberty claimants very, very powerful legal arguments that can be made within the aegis of Smith to make Smith look a lot more like a strict scrutiny uh, 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 regimen. Uh, and the question, is, to my mind, is, does it matter, therefore, and I think Professor Berg posed that question a minute ago, you know, it might not make a difference what they do with Smith because the religious liberty claimants may not win. I think it does matter for three reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that I think what you end up with is a, a difference in outcomes across circuits and therefore a situation where religious liberty does not mean the same thing across the United States of America. Right now, we are in the Seventh Circuit. I practice in the Eighth Circuit across the river. And in the Eighth Circuit, we have an opinion by Judge Strauss called Telescope Media that essentially is, it is decided on free speech, not free exercise grounds, but it means that if you're litigating in federal courts in the Eighth Circuit, you're, you're pretty likely to win this kind of claim. A district judge has to be pretty aggressive to sort of look at telescope media and say, ah, you still lose. Their chance of being reversed is probably pretty high. However, if you're litigating in Colorado State Court or Washington State Court, you're looking at a, <laughs> a very, very uh, long haul, and you are unlikely to prevail on very, very similar claims. Even I, I bet you if you took identical facts to, you know, uh, not to pick any courts, but identical facts into the Eighth Circuit, took him into the state proceedings where in, in these other states, you're looking at very, very different outcomes in similar cases. So of course, the, uh, uh, the narrow nature of these decisions, as Justice Alito states in his separate opinions in these cases, really makes the, the odyssey, the legal odyssey in the case of the Little Sisters of the Poor almost inevitable uh, uh, for a lot of America with no, like, no, no, uh, 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 guarantee of winning at the end. Baron L. Stetsman, a great example, ended up, her cert petition was denied last year, I think, and that was the end of years and years. She was the, one of the lead florist cases. That's Arlene's Flowers, right? Yeah. So one of the, uh, the cert petition was denied. She lost in the lower courts, notwithstanding Masterpiece Cake Shop, and, uh, and ended up with a huge uh, legal bill and a bunch of financial penalties. So, uh, so I think it does matter because, we, 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 because the law is 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 so narrow. The doctrines that are announced are so narrow, and they're, and this is my second point in many ways, is they're capable of inconsistent application or at least flexible application. You end up with non-uniform legal doctrines and therefore non-uniform scope of liberty on one of our most fundamental liberties all across the United States of America. I think that's not a good situation. And, and for that reason, I think it does make a difference that you didn't have, you know, we overrule Smith and so forth. Uh, 
Second, th second point I make is this allows for a kind of flexibility in the Supreme Court to apply its own doctrines. Uh, it gives them flexibility. It, it isn't that we know when we go back there, they're going to rule a certain way because the, di the, the rulings have been so narrow and there's grounds to distinguish and capable lawyers on the other side. So there's also future uncertainty as well as current non-uniformity in doctrines. And finally, it, you know, to borrow a phrase from Disagreeably Against Heller, this relic, or actually, no, it's McDonald against City of Chicago. This whole system where you're recasting free speech claims as free exercise claims in order to get the better legal doctrine really relegates religious liberty, which religious liberty is one of the greatest gifts of our country to the history of mankind, right? I mean, religious liberty really took roots in the United States of America during the colonial period as something brand new and, and shocking that has absolutely transformed the world, and yet our legal doctrines are relegated to a second-class right. So for those reasons, I think it is disappointing, uh, and it does make a difference the way these cases have come out. Thank you. So we have the opportunity for questions from the audience. Uh, while we're waiting for that to happen, I assume someone's got a microphone. Uh, I'll go ahead and exercise prerogative to ask a question or two. Um, There's a question for the whole panel, but the one, one of the early themes in the discussion was this notion of essentially, you know, why can't we all get along, uh, which certainly is a, a, a fundamental attribute of human decency, so it's very powerful. But here's my question. Is that an argument for the judiciary or for the political branches? And the reason I say that is, you know, the political branches is obviously where everybody is supposed to get along, or at least where everybody's supposed to participate, whereas the judiciary is essentially imposed, you know, particularly the federal side, imposed by unelected uh, life tenure judges. Uh, and so it feels more sort of forced, and people really don't have access across the board. So when the judiciary comes up with something that doesn't appear to be vetted by the political branches, is that really where, uh, why can't we all get along? Uh, is that where the arguments really should take hold or should it be in the political branches? This, this is for anybody to, to address. Um, well, at least for me on religious liberty, um, I, I think that the, uh, the uh, one of, the, one of the primary purposes for the protection of re religious liberty as an originalist matter, uh, in terms of original purposes, was to uh, get out of that cycle of coercion and counter coercion, anticipatory coercion, because you, you think that uh, the other side is going to do it to you. That is the backdrop, I mean, as John said, to the, to the founding era decision. Now, I guess that raises, you know, any question about what the courts should do obviously raises jurisprudential questions about what your theory of interpretation is. Uh, you, you might be sort of straight up original public meaning of the words in the text, uh, and then we just simply go with that. But if, you're, if your originalist approach is more purposive, and I don't, you know, I'm not a uh, constitutional theorist, so uh, I don't have, I have a kind of map of that, uh, exactly, but if your uh, if your view is about original purposes, then then clearly this this was one of the purposes, and I think we can tr construct doctrines uh, to apply to cases that will serve that purpose. Another purpose was to prevent, um, you know, to protect people from suffering for their faith. But those two purposes are very much intertwined because when people suffer suffer for their deep belief, they become resentful and. Uh, polarized and uh, and so on. So, um, I do think it's a role for courts, at uh, at least um, under some very uh, justifiable and honorable theories of even originalist interpretation. Well, if I if I may follow up, uh, no question there is the free exercise clause and RIFRA and a lot of uh, provisions on the books on that side. I guess what I'm talking about is on, on the flip side. Yeah. When we talk about LGBT. You know, Obergefell could have been done through the legislative process. It was being done. You know, states were looking at it. The U.S. Supreme Court obviously stepped in. Um, so that's sort of where I'm, where I'm talking about, you know, should those conversations be happening at the U.S. Supreme Court or through the political process? Um, big, big question. I guess it depends on the, on the, on the, on the question, right? Uh, um, you know, uh, you can have your opinion about Bostock as a reading of the, of the text of Title VII, um, you can have your opinion about whether the the reading of tradition in Obergefell is the right reading of tradition. If tradition is a 
uh, is a guidepost for substantive due process um, analysis, or if it should be privileges and immunities. I wasn't here at the last panel. Apparently, we got rid of the privileges and immunities clause then uh, in the last panel. Um, but, uh, you know, so is it the very specific tradition has to have been accepted, uh, or can we t talk about a tradition of marriage that, um, that then, then might be extended? Um, you know, I think it depends on jurisprudentially what, what your approach is, uh, uh, but uh, certainly legislation is maybe the, has to be the, the primary route. Yeah, so um, as an originalist, I certainly think Obergefell was not appropriate for the courts, um, and I think Bostick is also a problem there. Um, the big picture policy decision should be left to the, to the legislature. Where the judiciary has a role, and I, I alluded to this um, earlier when I was talking about um, judges having a bubble of, secular, of a secular worldview, and a lot of times the people appearing before them having a, living in a bubble of religious worldview and they can't communicate with each other. Um, we had a situation where, where client had two employees who had violated their, their statement of conduct. And this, this religious organization statement of conduct said basically uh, no sex outside of marriage. And there were two people at this organization who violated it, not with each other, but, but separately. Um, a woman who was fired and be went off and, and lived with the person who, who she had had an affair with. And a man who repented and was not fired as a result of that. Now, in their documents, they didn't have any explanation of repentance as, as being an exempt, exception from, from their statement of conduct. And the judge didn't understand when they tried to explain that the reason they had the different treatment of the two was that one had repented of, of the sin and one had not. Um, and because the judge didn't understand that, the judge held that it was, it was a pretextual um, uh, argument and that they were really just engaged in sex discrimination, um, which was not the client's situation. They, they had a sincere religious belief, but they were not speaking to each other. And so in that sense, you know, a, a willingness to, to try to understand the religious viewpoint is an area where I think the judiciary, um, particularly as we more and more have, have groups within this country that, that are talking past each other, can grow in. I echo what Justin said. I think that's a, that's a very good point. Questions? Right, there's one there. We'll, we'll come up here next. Am I first? Yeah. Show? Okay. Uh, Jordan Lawrence from Alliance Fending Freedom. And uh, uh, I want to pick up on Justin's point about sincerity of religion and then uh, uh, because I, I agree with him that there are situations where the government wrongly questions the sincerity of religion. But I want to direct this question to John. When you had the litigation with the Satanic Temple and uh, on their abortion challenges and their, you know, we want to pray before the city council and we want to put the goat demon god next to the crash at the state capitol. And I can't remember which ones have been where. But I think that uh, they're actually, they're not Satan worshipers, they're an anti-supernatural humanist group that really does not like religion at all. And they kind of bring these stink bomb cases to limit actual religious liberties. And so I'm just curious is did you uh, question their sincerity? And, and because that's been a real example, I think, of someone where I don't think they really believe what they're saying and they're just trying to freak people out to limit religious liberty? And can you call them out and say, this is what's really going on and the court should just dismiss it? Uh, wow, that's a great question, bringing up some of my favorite cases that I've ever dealt with. The, we did not have the, uh, we did not have a display case, we had, but we had multiple, actually three lawsuits where there was a challenge to our informed consent procedure under uh, uh, our abortion law that requires you know, the abortion provider to provide a booklet that talks about, you know, fetal development and things of that nature. They, the, the Satanic Temple had sued Missouri in three different lawsuits claiming that, uh, uh, you know, essentially that this was, they violated the Establishment Clause. Uh, in other words, you're preaching 
a, a, a religious message by articulating the message that life begins at conception and that, you know, here's the here's how unborn children develop. So uh, very interesting cases. And your question was, did we challenge the sincerity of that? They are a well-known uh, 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 group that do go around uh, as some People accuse them of political stunts. I take no position on that. Uh, but their website does describe them as a secular uh, organization, not really as a true religion. However, they do also describe themselves as composed of a, a group of secularists and political activists and genuine Satan uh, worshipers. So uh, the answer to your question is, did we raise that in the litigation? We considered it. Uh, 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 but for at least two reasons, we thought that that would be, uh, we probably better off. Number one is we were extremely busy and that would have required taking discovery. It was the summer of 2018 when my then boss was in a hotly contested political campaign and, and we were getting sued all the time by uh, on other issues essentially. Uh, 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 one issue was resource constraints. It was easier to write a 12B6 under Missouri's RIFRA in that particular case and just say, hey, let's assume for the sake of argument that they are a religious group. Here's why these claims really fail. Uh, uh, and then the second reason was uh, for the very reason that Justin said, I didn't want to be the one who's creating precedents on that you know, courts can examine, you know, kind of start prying into religious beliefs. Because I think in the vast majority of instances, those kinds of precedents are going to be wielded like weapons against kind of much more ordinary religious practice. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, Justin gave some good examples of that. I think it is a new thing and it's not a surprising development when there are powerful voices in the left and they're not secret, they're very open about this, that equate traditional religious beliefs on a lot of these you know, sex and reproduction related moral issues uh, with bigotry. To, 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 I think to, in many cases, very sincerely, those people believe that it is no different than being a, you know, a evil racist to be a traditional Christian and subscribe to traditional Christian views on some of those things. It's not just Christian, obviously, it's uh, uh, other major religious traditions as well. Uh, so uh, I thought if we could win on the narrow ground, I mean, actually it's really not the narrow ground, it's the broader ground, uh, uh, that that probably be, it would lead to develop uh, better doctrines. And we did, I mean, the federal cases we got rid of on standing, there are all kinds of problems with that. It's not clear that they ever really had a client. They were proceeding under a Jane Doe pseudonym and, and then uh, a Jane Doe emerged when cases were on appeal and said, hey, they sued on my behalf, but I never authorized them to and so forth. But we ended up winning on, on the other, other ground. My question is, uh, you're very frustrated take on the Smith case head on, how could a case be structured or teed up to essentially force the Supreme Court to address it head on and either reaffirm it or reverse it? I mean, any, are, 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 are anything in the works uh, that you know of that end? Can I piggyback on that? Uh, this is the same basic question. Is, uh, if I recall during the debate in Congress over RIFRA, uh, a number of folks uh, talked about Employment Division v. Smith as the Dred Scott of the First Amendment. Dred Scott obviously being one of, one of the worst possible things you could say about any decision by any court. Why is this thing so hard to get rid of? Uh, uh, I don't I'm not have... blaming you. I'm just asking. <laughs> do, you all, do you all have a theory? My question is, do you all have a theory? I think you're making the same point. What is the theory for how... You, you talk about religious liberty advocates. Is it their fault? Is it somebody... I mean... I, I, what is your theory for why this is still on the books? Well, it was, you know, it was always the case in Smith that there, I mean, Smith announced a general rule that said, no exemptions if the law is neutral and generally applicable. And that sounds on the, you know, on the face of it, if you stop there, that is devastating to religious liberty. Anti-discrimination laws aren't targeted at religion, they're not pa passed for that purpose solely and they apply pretty broadly and what about you know what about the minister uh, suing the church uh, uh, under that generally applicable law at the time the courts were uh, the time the riff came uh, was debated courts were construing Smith in that way the uh, the animal sacrifice case Church of the Lakumi that the court decided in 1993 was nine nothing. Ultimately, the Supreme Court decided. The 11th Circuit had, read, had ruled the other way. It had read Smith to say that this law, which had all sorts of exceptions and all sorts of interpretive uh, 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 provisions in it that allowed the, uh, the, the, the government to say, essentially, there's any reason for killing an animal in South Florida is okay, as long as you're not doing it in a Santeria 
uh, religious right. right? Kosher slaughterhouses are okay. Right? They, they carefully, carefully drafted it. The 11th Circuit had upheld that. Smith looked like it was really uh, devastating at that point. But it had a number of different things in it that gave rise to, to, you know, to, to the kind of claims that John, John talks about. The, 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 the dynamic was that Justice Scalia wanted to get rid of exemptions, but he didn't have the votes to get rid of Sherbert and Yoder. And therefore, he wrote in exceptions into the Smith rule or con confined the scope of the rule so as to not do anything that would, uh, that would overrule Sherbert and Yoder. That, m that meant saying, for example, that where the government recognizes other claims at least under an individualized procedure for accommodating other claims, then religion has to get the same uh, pr treatment. And that's how he explained Sherbert. That's been extended to do this the, the, kind of the, the, that John and I both talked about where if the government gives exceptions to other activities, it has to give them uh, to religion, and that has been extremely powerful. So the, you know, the, the parts of Smith that, that, that could generate strong protection um, We've taken advantage of them. Yeah, I think an, another sort of a practical answer to that is that the worst excesses of Smith were not realized because RIFRA came about and RLUIPA. And um, um, had there not been RIFRA and RLUIPA, I think there would have been more pressure to reverse Smith. But that that let enough of the pressure out that that the real problems didn't come up as egregiously as they could have. And then just a footnote to that, uh, uh, I thought Fulton, I thought the outcome of Fulton was very surprising. I thought when they granted on overrule Smith, it was very, very likely that was gonna happen. Uh, and the question is, is there a good case out there? I think a Fulton is really an ideal vehicle so in other words, I think they've already had an ideal vehicle. There's lots and lots of vehicles out there because it's, it's a very uh, you know uh, fruitful area of litigation. But I thought that Fulton itself, where you had you know a Catholic agency, you had like just wonderful facts that are just, make you laugh. You read Justice Alito's opinion where he talks about the mayor of Philadelphia saying we got to call Pope Francis and have him come here and kick some ass over there. In other words, <laughs> so both it's like you think of the Pope kicking ass is funny, but also he's like you know I, the mayor of Philadelphia, understand the Catholic Church and Catholic doctrine better than. And, you know, Catholic Social Services of Philadelphia. Uh, uh, I thought that was a surprising thing. And you had a Catholic agency that had literally never, it had never come up. They had never violated the anti-discrimination statute because no one had ever applied. And yet there was a news story in the local paper about how the bishop had said, well, this would be our policy if it's ever arisen. And then they were, you know, cut out. I thought that was kind of a, in many ways, an ideal vehicle to reconsider that. If I were a practitioner, you know, representing private plaintiffs, which I don't do anymore, I would have been like, wow, this is, this is a great test case. Let's bring it. And, and the outcome was a ruling in favor, right, after losses in the Third Circuit, uh, a ruling in the U.S. Supreme Court in favor of the client, but not one that takes the big doctrinal step that clarifies the law in the way that one would have wanted. I think it may need to be a case that's not a culture wars case. Um, a couple of terms ago, there was a case called Ricks versus Idaho Contractors Board, which is essentially the state licensing board for building contractors in the state of Idaho. And you had to submit your social security number for that. And Mr. Ricks uh, believes that the social security system, right, is the mark of the beast, and, and so on. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I'm not saying that that would have been the case, but some case that is outside the usual culture wars, uh, the, the court might be more willing to, you know, take that that step. You know, the problem with teeing up a case is how do you tee up a case uh, to over, overrule Smith? You don't argue the other things, you know, the, the, the existing protections? No, you wanna, wa wanna do that, we wa you wanna argue those. We have a similar question with another really bad past decision called CLS versus Martinez, Christian Legal Society versus Martinez, which was the one that said state universities could exclude religious groups from meeting, uh, from the student uh, you know, activities program and from any funding and from being able to reserve a room. So they, they just have to like, try to walk around and find an empty room in order, order to meet. And the court said that was fine uh, as long as you did that for all groups. Now it was a joke to say that the university in that case had actually done it. But since then, courts have uh, uh, groups have argued and shown that the, that the universities really weren't 
uh, even-handed in this, right? So what do you do? Do you keep showing that the universities aren't even-handed and live within the confines of Martinez? Or do you try to you know, soft pedal that and, and go for overruling it. I think Martinez is ripe for, ripe for overruling. I don't think it, the majority of the court believes it now, nor should they. But it, uh, to, you know, litigate the case out with that focus uh, is not necessarily good tactically. And by the way, an interesting, an interesting point on that. In, I believe, Tandon versus Newsom, um, there's, a, there's a little comment in there that the Supreme Court views RIFRA not just as a statute, and they've said several times, you know, it's a super statute, but but they they say there that RIFRA is Congress's statement of its understanding of the First Amendment's free exercise clause. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting shift that we've not seen. And so I wonder if that's going to signal something in the future. We have to down for one more. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm having an issue wrestling with which question to ask. So if they become convoluted, feel free to take one and run with it. Um, well, we have uh, one minute, so I, I think choose, we're, the, choose uh, the less convoluted version. I, I, I believe we're running into an uh, issue of uh, you know working within the confines of precedent and legislation that, as it currently exists, with uh, Smith and how we're dealing with cases through the uh, Smith doctrines. Uh, but with that uh, Kentucky case and with Phillips. Um, I'm starting to wonder about whether or not the question of exercise needs to be more uh, in the uh, forefront of argument, uh, specifically with the uh, COVID restrictions, is uh, what is exercise? And are we using the confines of the argumentation of the opposition to free exercise to say exercise is worship within a congregation and not exercise is living one's faith as one believes they should. I mean, I, I think that, that it's most courts understand exercise to be sort of anything that's motivated by your, your faith. Um, there have been people who've argued. So for instance, the government argued in, um, I want to say in the Hobby Lobby, um, or no, it was not Hobby Lobby. It was Hosanna Tabor. The government argued in the Hose their Hosanna Tabor argument that basically exercise just means belief. Um, but, but outside of some, some outliers like that, I think most courts understand that exercise is much broader than just worship or just belief, but it encompasses things motivated, motivated by faith. Well, I think we are out of time. Please join me in uh, thanking the wonderful panel.